Hiya, and welcome. Yep, got the mic. Hi, to those who don't know me, my name is Arti Ramkrishna, and I am an educator, as well as a DEI advocate. Um, so my talk today is titled, All Are Welcome. Um, but I'm asking you to think about for a second, do you think the word, the phrase, the signage um, of all are welcome is just an empty platitude, which is just meaningless and just paying lip service to um, inclusion? Or is it a litmus test of any company or organization's commitment to DEI? So keep that in mind as we go along. Um, this QR code will take you directly to the slides if you want to follow along or rewatch it at some time. So before we start, I, I changed it to um, five agreements. So first, I'm asking that you stay engaged. Um, and I promise you, if you live in white skin, you will experience some discomfort. Speak your truth when we speak up. We speak our truth. Um, this is a safe space. Um, and if you're a person of color from the global majority, understand that this um, talk is not going to give you closure on DEI. And also, please understand that um, good intentions pave the road to you know where. So impact is greater than intent. Um, before we move on, we're, uh, the terms people of color and BIPOC have fallen out of favor because it centers white, whiteness as the center and all other people as people of color. And it's also just a US only social con cultural construct. And so the preferable term now is people of the global majority or people from the global south. All right, so here it is. Why might this phrase, all are welcome, be an empty platitude, just meaningless, just a sign that gets slapped on a door and say, hey, we are, you know, we are committed to DEI. And hint, I don't like it. Please. Okay, that's great. Um, in the United States, we have to classify the letter movement, and in response to that, the people say all lives matter, which is a phrase that you're referring to, right? Yes, and so is this. So I'm not saying that everybody from the global majority is going to find this offensive, but to me, all our welcome positions white people as generous benefactors of the space where they're condescendingly and graciously welcoming people of color into the space. I don't like that. So there's that. So uh, this is Dr. Clark. He and his wife, Mamie, in 1947, conducted the original doll experiment. Um, some of you saw the reiteration of that experiment last year when I presented at Boyd. So this is 1947, and... Black doll? There you go. And which one is the white doll? Which doll? So what Dr. Clark was asking the children is they had a white doll and a black doll. So he begins by asking the children to point out to the white doll and the black doll, and then he starts asking much more leading questions. Is the pretty doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? And which doll is the bad doll? And, what, and why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because, he, because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? Yeah, which one looks like? Um, that one. Okay. Nothing has changed. Um, Italian researchers two years ago replicated this um, experiment in Italy with the exact same results. So that's something to think about. Black doll. Um, so we 
label people African American, differently abled. So this professor, Fabian Shorte, says, please stop defining people by their challenges. And I think this is a great lens for us to use when we look at people who are different and being othered by the world. I said Fabian is about not defining people by their challenge, right? So once you recognize that I aspire to be a scientist or a leader, or maybe I just aspire to graduate high school. You know, like, I have a goal to be a student, right? Whatever that aspiration is, if you acknowledge that aspiration before you uh, go into my various challenges, you're telling a truer story about me, right? I don't run around believing I'm an at-risk this or a low-income that or a high poverty, high crime. Like, no one carries around those labels thinking that's how I'm going to face the world, right? What people think about is, I want to maybe go to school. I want to maybe someday own a home. I want to maybe possibly get out of this neighborhood or come back to this neighborhood and build. Whatever that person's aspiration is, if you haven't bothered to acknowledge that aspiration before you engage them, then you've made them an object in the sentence. They are a thing to be dealt with, to be moved, to be manipulated. They are not a person. And once you start to engage people as, as obstacles, once you start engaging people as problems, then recognize that you've now become the problem, right? So the sad reality for many people from the global majority is a dehumanizing experience. Did I skip one? No. So we all have biases. Some are implicit. We don't even know we have them. And some are pretty explicit. So the thing to me as an educator, I've taught preschool, I've taught kindergarten, I've taught children who speak other languages, I've taught children in special education. No matter where I've taught in the United States, global majority children are subject to far more attention, surveillance, and punitive discipline than any other um, race. And this begins in preschool. Good morning. How are you? Cool. So. Can we talk about how you got here? Uh, <laughs> hey, you think I got a funny looking face? <laughs> <laughs> hey, kids, I'm still you guys here. Man, we ain't doing nothing. Why are you here before I'm cookouts? So, you didn't do anything? Nope. Then what's all this? Depends on who's reading it. I guess. Well, looks broken. Skateboarding, huh? Yes. Is this the first time you've hurt yourself? No, I get hurt all the time. At home? At home? He hurt himself skateboarding. At the park. Okay, ma'am. I'm going to have a counselor come in and speak with you. A counselor? For what? He's okay. Boy, I done told you them tricks were going to put you in the hospital. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too. A nurse will be in in a few minutes to help you check out. What's up? That doctor thought I did this to him. It ain't fair. Fair has nothing to do with this. This is about you taking responsibility for your actions. Look, 
I know so many young men just like you that didn't do anything. And yet, most of them are in prison. You don't know me. I ain't going to no prison. If you don't want to end up in prison, you're going to have to get some new priorities and probably some new friends, too. Look, you're not getting any younger. You need to get an education so you can get a good job. But you, you just like everybody else. You say you see, but you don't see. You see what you want to see. I see what's in this folder. It shows me what you've been doing. I ain't doing nothing. I am not doing anything. Stop! I do nothing. I'm not doing anything. And yes, you were. Get to the timeout chair. Now, please. is probably going to shake but some of those things have happened to me when my son was in the hospital he'd had a migraine for days and days and days and the doctors would give him medicine we'd go home he'd get a migraine again we'd end up back in the hospital so one day the nurse asked him um, you're okay you're gonna go home today and he said I don't want to go home I get hurt when I'm home because he was young so they called DHS and they interviewed me and then they interviewed my son, and he said, I mean that when I go home, the migraine comes back. And I'm an educator with God only knows how many master's degrees. I've lived here 26 years. None of it matters. Um, these have been heavy, but I have something that will be much nicer to watch. So what this video tells us is children from the global majority don't see themselves in the world. When they walk around the world, they, they're not on posters, they're not in, on Pampers diaper boxes, they're not in the movies. But these sweet little babies see themselves represented in pop culture or in society. And I want you to for, you know, just look at the joy on the faces. <laughs> They're about to show it. Keep watching.
why does representation matter? Any thoughts? It helps us, um, people from the global majority feel seen, like we're actually a part of society, that we matter and that we bring value. And so the issue, and I'm gonna speak from the perspective of an educator who's taught solely in the United States, but I know that much of this happens across the world and p might play out differently, but there's a huge mismatch. In the district where I teach, um, students from the global majority at 62% are teachers from the global majority, 2%. So children don't see teachers who look like them. And white teachers either don't understand or don't want to try to understand. And this mismatch has devastating consequences for children. So I wanted to explain why the mismatch is so massive. So across the world, every country has had a cultural profile made. So as you can see, the United States is the only one of that color. That means it is pretty much a standalone culture. And why does this matter? So this is the Lewis model. So if you are in the blue, then you are factual, you have urgency, you want things to be perfect, but you are also just very cool and decisive. And as you move towards the red, you are what it's called multi-active. So multi-active um, cultures are warm, they're emotional, they like to talk a lot, and they're impulsive. They don't always sit down and think about things. They go by their gut. And the yellow countries are reactive. They're very amiable. They, um, courtesy is very important to them. They don't like conflict, so they're very accommodating, and they are good listeners. And of course, between linear active and multi-active, if you're in the purple, you know, you might have characteristics of both. And as you can see, I'm from India, so I have characteristics of two very passionate um, cultures, but also I am not um, decisive. I do not like conflict. So when I'm being harmed, I don't bring it up. And I paid for that. So these are the countries. So North America, Britain, Australia, and all those um, Western countries are linear active. Most major countries in Asia are reactive and Southern Europe, Mediterranean countries, and India, Pakistan, and most of the Slavic nations are multi-active. So can you come up with a hypothetical discriminatory situation that might happen at school between a white teacher and a student that is from the global majority? Can you think of a situation that might occur in a classroom? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, what about a student from Japan who never raises their hand to speak up? Or a student who is very used to having um, distance between people, body, body space is very important to them. And can you see how a white teacher in the US might look at that child and think he's disengaged? He doesn't care about his education, he doesn't participate but it isn't true. So now we have an idea about the mismatch, right, between the teachers and those students, but what are the consequences of a teacher who doesn't understand you, who doesn't see you for who you are, who stereotypes you, who doesn't have high expectations for you, who talks about you in racially coded ways and disproportionately disciplines you and polices everything about you, your actions, your tone, your hair, your accent, your food, and all of that. Did I say I don't like people? Wait, so you said you are what? You are racist? Standard, like, 
You are racist. Everybody's a racist at, at that level. No, Lou, you said you are racist. <laughs> I did. Yeah, 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 I'm not saying you're racist. No, I'm not saying you're racist. I said it enough. So you're racist. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now, with a teacher like that, why would students be engaged? Why would they care about school? So this also has the consequence of chronic absenteeism. Children just don't want to come to school. And then the teachers are like, see, I told you, they don't care about school. They don't want to do well. Why can't I go to the next one? Okay. I've got more. Heather. So we saw that the, vid the video before this was in middle school. This is a video about children in school. Can you rhyme? So if I say cat, Four-year-old JJ and his three-year-old brother Joa are doing what children their age do. <laughs> Running and playing one minute, pushing the next. <laughs> when they act up at home, they are disciplined. I think that they're typical four- and three-year-olds. <laughs> but at school? He's been suspended about five times. At um, three? At three. Five. And I can't make this up. I wish I was. He hit one of the teachers on the arm and they sent him home. And they said that they considered that hitting to be a danger to the staff. The most recent report says 7,500 children nationwide were suspended at least once from public preschool. Yes, preschool. The alarming numbers reported by the Department of Education also say black students are being suspended and expelled at a rate three times greater than white kids across all grades. We know there is a correlation between doing out-of-school suspensions and expulsions in ultimately locking kids up. For far too many children in communities, the school to prison pipeline is real. And the fact that it starts as young as four, again, simply isn't good enough. In Los Angeles, America's second largest school district, Superintendent John Dacey finds the trend disturbing. Why are these numbers playing out this way? Ma'am, I think they're the same biases that are in society. And so I don't think this, I think this is a reflection of the growth we have yet to do in this country around these issues. What shocked him? the reason the majority of suspensions in his district were for something called willful defiance it was things like failure to do homework failure to bring your notebook to class and that's not willful defiance that's adolescence a year ago the district became the first in the nation to remove willful defiance as a reason for suspensions and the numbers have dropped ever since three years ago there were 19,000 suspensions this year 8,000 the teachers' union never took a stance on the issue, with some teachers saying willful defiance has been abused, and others saying it takes an important disciplinary tool away from their classrooms. I teach my kids all the time, education is your passport. Jeanette Powell learned that the hard way. Long before her sons were born, she was labeled a troublemaker. As the daughter of a drug-addicted father, she struggled in school and life. You know, I was expelled from school when I was three years old, in preschool. Expelled. And when I first got the phone call about, about JJ, I immediately thought back to that. You know, at a young age, I was told that I was a bad kid in school. Jeanette proved them wrong, eventually got her college degree, wrote a book, and became an accomplished public speaker, even giving a TED Talk. Get behind the line. The Powells have worked hard to make a good life for their children. My biggest fear is that they'll be labeled and that they'll believe it. Every day she fights to inspire her boys. Right more a preschool to pre-med mentality. Go! Go, Joa! Go, Joa! Go, Joa! Than preschool to prison. Sarah Seidner, CNN, <laughs> Omaha. Um, whoops. Didn't mean to do that. Um, in the United States, black students are far more represented than children from the South Asian community. I also got a call from preschool when my son was two. Um, I answered the phone and the teacher said, um, we would like Nikki not to come to school tomorrow. And I said, why? And he, she said, we were playing, a ha you know, had circle time and he wanted the truck that the other boy had and he just took it. And I was like, oh, okay, and? So that 
willful defiance. He was two. Needless to say. Do you rhyme? So if I say cat, in the heart. I'm not going to read that. So racism is everywhere. I deal with it every day, but there's acceptable racism that's generally socially acceptable, and there's overt racism that's unacceptable. And you can see how many things are okay. When I moved to this country, they asked me where I, where, how long I had lived here, and I said two days. And they said, wow, you picked up English so quickly. You are so articulate for a brown person. And when I uh, brought up racial discrimination at work, they were like, oh, you're, you're too emotional. You're too angry. So this happens every single day in every preschool, in every elementary school. And eventually, some, most of these children get shut out of university, high-paying jobs, STEM, IT, so the problem starts much, much before they um, enter the workforce. So this is the state of diversity in the United States currently. For the very first time in the history of the United States, non-Hispanic white people make up 59%. We have never had white people be less than 60%. But 77% of the people in the workforce are white. Where are the rest of the people? Gen Z, nearly 50% are minorities. That's from a research paper. Does 50% sound like a minority? For those under 18 today, there is no ethnic group or race that's dominant. It's an equal mix. And yet, white people make up 82% of management occupations. People with a disability have a hard time finding jobs. 40% of people who are othered, not mainstream, white, cis, English-speaking, middle class, have faced harassment. And over 50% of LGBTQIA workers have experienced some sort of unfair treatment. So when we operate, in mostly white spaces. And whether it doesn't matter whether you're a child or an adult from the global majority, there's consequences to that. We have to operate in white spaces as a matter of necessity and survival because we need to go to school or we need to go to work. So just to survive and then hopefully to thrive, we have to adopt certain behaviors. Families tell their children, Okay, listen, you can't speak in black English. Remember to speak like the white people do. Remember not to wear cornrows, or remember not to wear a shirt that says Black Lives Matter. Those are not acceptable white space behaviors. And this is starting to happen as young as preschool. And they go to school, they go to work, and they're facing negative stereotypes, and they want to prove them wrong, so they change themselves. Changing yourself comes at a very big cost because you're compromising who you are and prioritizing the comfort of white people so that they will leave you alone. And this threatens their true identity and it creates psychological, physical, and emotional stress. So very often, I'm applying to jobs now, and very often they'll say, Oh, in our work culture, we encourage you to bring your whole self to work. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not safe for us to bring our whole self to work because that's considered unprofessional. Professionalism is coded for whiteness. <sighs> so Maslow is, um, I'm sure many of you know, have heard of him, created the hier hierarchy of needs. He's a very famous psychologist and he created a pyramid of what humans need to thrive 
and then basically survive. So at the very bottom, you've got phys physiological needs. You need food, you need water, air, sleep, and clothes. And then you have safety needs, where you feel safe out and about in the world, you have a job, you have money, you, you have decent health. And then you move up to love and belonging, you have friends, you have a sense of societal connection, and then you have respect and self-esteem and feeling valued and seen, and you have, you have freedom. And at the very top is self-actualization, where you can work towards becoming the best version of you. But as you can see, when you face discrimination every single day of your life, you are stuck in physiological and safety needs. Every time you try to move up to love and belonging, something else happens and you fall back down. And then society portrays people from the global majority as lazy, because they're not working hard, they're not engaging, they're not helping to improve society. This might be a triggering term from some of you, but this is how white supremacy work, um, shows up at work, and I can tell you with a million bloody percent confidence, this is true. This has happened to me again and again and again. Perfectionism. They expect everything to be perfect. You're, there is no room for mistakes. There is no room for learning, and everything is urgent. Agendas, deadlines. And then if you speak up and say, hey, that wasn't very nice, I felt offended, you face white people's defensiveness. But I didn't mean it. I'm like, that's why I said impact is greater than intent. You might not have meant to. Um, at school, when I used to teach this same sort of thing, I would teach them that, think about playing at recess with a ball. You kick the ball. You didn't mean to aim it at a child. It hit his head, and now he has a concussion. You didn't mean it, but the impact on that child is still there. So all of these go on and on and on. There's only one right way. You either do this or you do that. Fear of conflict, and say, I didn't mean that. You're, take, you're too sensitive. Progress is everything, and right to comfort, and which is why people of color from the global majority hesitate to bring up issues because society just optimizes white people's right to comfort, to feeling like, I'm a good person, I'm nice. And as I said, we've been talking about the United States, but increasingly, this is a global problem. And now with AI and facial recognition, humans with emotions and brain and rational thinking can be racist. What will machines be? I just read a study where it said that even motion sensors in women's bathrooms don't recognize darker tones. And I can tell you that's true. I'll be at a wall, I'm like, mm -mm, not, no water, no soap. But the white woman next to me, no problem. I move to her tap, still nothing. That's just an ordinary everyday example for you. I know we're out of time and it's a lunch hour and you're supposed to go take a photograph, but I have much, much more to say. Um, Christy, what, what time did you want to? Okay, so I'll, I'll just zip through it. So what we need to focus on now is making sure people feel seen, valued, heard, and really focus on belonging. If, you, if your um, colleagues don't feel heard, they don't feel like their contributions are valued, and they can't bring their authentic self to work, they're not going to be good workers. It's a very painful thing to feel socially excluded. And research has shown social exclusion and the pain that results from it is the, almost the same as physical pain. So it's not just about business. It's not just about the bottom line. It's about human humanity. We all crave connection. We all want to be validated. We all want to be understood. So when you do have a culture of belonging, research shows that there's a 56% improvement in people's performance. 
they don't resign, they take fewer sick days, they show up at work. Why don't you go for a walk? Know what's going on. Okay, so how do we do it? Create a sense of community, make sure people know each other, make sure they have opportunities to connect, create affinity groups where there's safe spaces for people from the global majority. Listen to them. Create an environment where they can come to you and say, hey, I want to be open and honest about what I'm facing at work. Show compassion and please, for the love of God, believe them. It's going to take so much for a person from the global majority to get over their fear of conflict and to come up to you and say that this isn't going well for me. Please, please believe them. And then address them promptly and transparently. Be intentional about the language you use. Make sure to give those diverse perspectives and voices and elevate them. Create DEI opportunities and initiatives and ERGs that are meaningful and intentional and not just something you slap on and the minute there's a budget cut, that's the first thing to go. So DEI, I've said, is greater than DEI BJL. DEI is diversity, equity, inclusion. And what we're trying to move towards is diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice, and then eventually liberation, where we don't need to have DEI at all. So there's barriers to DEI programs. Um, we have, nobody's really created a good metric for whether a DEI program is successful. There isn't enough training. There's no buy-in from leadership. And budgetary reaction, uh, restrictions. Well, the recent tech layoffs, um, the first people to be fired were DEI managers. And cultural resistance. Think about those biases that you hold. This is a new term that's come about, diversity dishonesty. It's when a company or an organization says, oh my gosh, all are welcome. We are invested in this. But it's like they hire diverse people, put them on posters, they put them on YouTube. But they stay in junior positions because it's all about the optics. So why, there's a lot of DI pushback. People feel individually threatened. They feel socially threatened and they might make comments like this. I will leave this for later. Um, maybe we should go take a photograph. And if you took the QR code image, you have my slides to go back and revisit videos or um, data. And I'm here to answer questions af after the photo. I don't want to stress my friends out about that. Thank you for your en engagement today. And I'll just share. I'll leave this for now. And then if we have time and you want to come back, we can talk some more. Thank you.